Hello, everybody. Glad to see you all have joined us today. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Belinda Alise Collin. I am the Vice President of the Food Canada Division at Dempsey Corporation. And I am also a past president of CIFST, and I've been a CIFST member for over 25 years, I believe. On behalf of CIFST, welcome to our 2021 Table Talks webinar series, The Learning Trough, where we bring you regular webinars that explore the future of food. If you haven't already, please visit CIFST's website for a list of upcoming webinars which will continue every second week between September and November. And if you are a member of CIFST, which I highly recommend you take a look at, registration for the entire webinar series is free. Thank you also to Dempsey Food for their generous sponsorship of our webinar series. So today our topic is Ask Me Anything with Dana McCauley, who is the Chief Experience Officer with the Canadian Food Innovation Network. She is also a new director with the CIFST board. So welcome to the CIFST board, Dana. So welcome, Dana. Why don't you get us started by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks so much, Belinda. I am um, so glad to, to be here. This is, this is such a fun concept. For those of you who uh, don't know me or have only known me in my uh, food, you know, corporate kind of food business context, I uh, have basically spent my career getting further away from people's mouths. So I started out as a chef working in fine dining. Back in the day, there was quite a famous restaurant in Toronto called Pronto, and I worked there. And I left uh, being a chef to go into food media, which was an amazing segment of my career where I worked uh, at lots of women's services magazines, like uh, Chatelaine, Canadian Living, Homemakers, Style at Home, Gardening Life, you know, just, just so much uh, really great experience there, learning about what people cared about in the context of food, and wrote some cookbooks, and that all got attention of industry who started to say, well, can you do recipes for me? Can you do this for me? Can you help me develop products? And uh, I developed a, a business that um, uh, did all of that, which was really exciting, and discovered I had this, this talent for coming up with products that filled gaps, that, uh, that that needed to be filled, that consumers really wanted to find products in, which led me to join a few really great, big, uh, wonderful Canadian food companies like Jane's Family Foods and Plata Chef and Sabina, uh, and uh, hold executive roles. So when I left corporate, I was the executive director and, and founding executive director for Food Starter which some people may remember. It's now District Ventures Kitchens, which is Arlene Dickinson's uh, company, but uh, I started it up with the City of Toronto and helped to launch like 130 or 140 food businesses and helped them to launch many, many products. And I left there to help the University of Guelph develop a way to take uh, food and agri-food inventions and turn them into innovations that could become businesses with impact for the outside world and the Canadian economy. So just recently, I'm in the middle of week four, I uh, got back into Capital F Foods, so I took one step back towards people's mouths again, and I am uh, now with CFIN, and I, I've just put a little bit of uh, info about CFIN in the chat, but in a nutshell, my new job is to help people working in the food industry to do transformative projects that will help Canada to have more economic impact with food. And uh, that could be anything from automation and robotics to AI and machine learning to developing cool new novel ingredients. So hopefully another day we can uh, all meet and, and talk about uh, I can listen and hear about the projects that people have in mind, but in the meantime, uh, folks can become a member of CFIN, and that'll help us to to uh, stay in communication. Hmm, amazing! That what a journey! I've I've um, I've 
followed you um, since you've been in a corporate when you worked with, um, you know, James and Pledge of Chef, but I didn't know about what you did before. So that's pretty amazing to hear about where you came from and how you got into the food industry, because I don't think that's a very um, usual path, I guess. It's different. So it, it just shows yeah. that there's a lot of different ways to get in. So uh, you've just described one of them. That's amazing. Thank you so much. So um, before we get started to the Ask Me Anything portion, uh, we're just going to ask an icebreaker question to warm things up. And because uh, we've been in a pandemic for so long and we've been watching so much TV and reading so many books, I thought it would be interesting to ask Dana, is there a book, television show or movie that you recently discovered that you would recommend? And if you have several recommendations, I would be happy to hear those too. Well, I, I certainly did more than my fair share of uh, media consumption during the lockdown, and I'm always a big reader. Uh, TV show-wise, for anyone who really wants to think about something after they watch it, so it's escapism, but it plants some really interesting seeds. I loved, loved, loved the show um, uh, The White Lotus, which uh, was on Crave, I guess, uh, and, and is now on demand. It just uh, really really well done and, and just every little, you know, every little point of it uh, is, is there for a reason. So I, I love that show. But a book that I would recommend to folks on this call is, that isn't really about food or food innovation, but it is about the, the, the sort of theme of innovation is Machines Like Me, which is a novel by Ian McEwan. So if you ever read atonement or you know um, he's got so many great books uh, and, and some of them have been made into movies you'll you'll know that he's an amazing amazing writer and machines like me there's actually a quote that I keep on my bulletin board right above my camera here so I can read it to you guys it's uh, it's about how um, uh, AI and robots will you know start to become integrated into our lives. It's set in the past, which is weird, but anyways, that, that's not as interesting. But this quote is one that I, it keeps me a bit grounded when I'm thinking I'm like really doing something cool because as we know, as soon as we have something, like here's an iPhone 7, well, now I need an iPhone 10. You know, I have my work phone and my personal phone. It just becomes obsolete. So this little quote is, the future kept arriving. Our bright new toys began to rust before we could get them home and life went on much as before. So it's interesting because as much as we think we're, we're breaking ground and transforming, uh, people in our business have to have appetite to keep doing that, right? Like yes. you never get to the end. So uh, yes. I, I think yes. that's maybe a, a, a reco that, that'll appeal mm -hmm. to, to this audience. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, I wrote those down, so hopefully everyone else did too. Um, and actually, that's a pretty good segue into um, our questions. So um, if you didn't get your questions in ahead of time, there is still an opportunity to have them answered. So you can enter questions into the question box. And depending on how we're doing with time, we'll see if um, Dana will be able to answer them near the end. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions in advance. The questions are excellent. And I, for one, am very interested to hear what Dana is going to say about uh, all of these very good questions. So without further ado, let's get to the questions. So question number one and question number two, I think can be um, somewhat combined. So question number one is how does one approach industry with a new innovative product? And question two is what important things must you do before approaching industry with a new innovation? So those two might be able to be answered together. Fantastic, fantastic question. And it's so interesting because um, my new uh, uh, colleague at CFIN, Joe Lake, who some of you might know, he's a food scientist and, and worked with McCain for 12 years as their global director of innovation. He and I were having a conversation about this the other day. So often people uh, that I've worked with and people who've asked me for advice uh, and people I've just kind of observed, they think that they should go into industry with a huge idea. And as we all know, uh, manufacturers can't have any downtime on their lines. They can't take their equipment apart and put it back together because for whatever reason, every time you do that, 
things are different, right? So, so it's very high risk for them to adopt uh, an innovation if it's you know mechanized innovation um, on something that's really important and, and makes their bread and butter. And and Joe had this great thing. He's like, yeah, you know, go in with something low risk, like say, hey, if you're a robotics company, let me uh, put sensors and robots into your QA and we'll do a pilot and we'll see how that goes. Because you can't really expect people to join you at the end of the journey. Like they have to be, they want yeah. have to be socialized to it. And even if you have a champion internally in a company, chances are they only have one voice around the table. So the, you know, the second part of that question is understand who you should be selling to. Um, who's going to sign the PO? So if it is the CFO who's actually going to make that decision because you're showing that, that whatever you're bringing in, whether it's an ingredient or, as I say, something, a piece of equipment or something, you obviously want to prove the financial case for that. So if it's a financial person that's going to make the decision and champion that to the board and the CEO, then make sure you're, you have a contact there. It, just because something's to do with R&D doesn't mean the director of R&D can make that decision. He or she might need to, to sell that internally. Mm -hmm. So have empathy for the process of the person who will be your internal champion and make sure that you give them the tools because I've been the person who loved an idea that someone brought to me. And then when I took it to, you know, uh, an ops meeting, the ops people were like, well, that doesn't sound very interesting to us and boom, mm -hmm. it died. Yeah. And I think um, there's a problem too with even financial um, incentives because um, it takes, it costs so much to, to implement a new innovation. So the financial incentive you have to come in with is so large for a company to even be interested in it. Would you say that's true? Uh, yeah, I would. And, and so, you know, and, and that comes back to, you know, having case studies and having done prototyping yeah. and and having real world, you know, examples of, of how your your project can work. And um, to that point, you know, uh, it's a great great opportunity for me to tell folks that next week I'll be launching program guides for two funding programs that will help with that kind of thing. So if you can mm -hmm. find nice. a funding program or work with a research institution who can help you to to validate that you know your 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 innovation actually can and will work in a scaled up setting that's that's obviously yeah. very important too okay great so really understanding your customer is key and what it is that they need okay so next question is um what is a normal timeline timeline for testing and presenting industry with an innovation. So how long does it take to do business development, especially if you're coming from outside the industry? Well, that question, of course, could be answered with any amount of time because so much of it has yeah. to, the, the runway has to do with what it is you're, you're developing. So um, I think you need to understand, uh, I think the, where this question is coming from is how long will it take me to get a sale? And I would say that that is, um, directly proportional to when people do budgets and that kind of thing. So understanding when companies have year ends and if they're public companies, that's really easy to find out, right? Because their shareholders will have mm -hmm. an annual report probably posted on a website. So find out when a company's year end is and go in with the right type of expectations. Most organizations I've worked in, it's been like three or four months before the year end that we do the really granular budget and and decide what we're we're going to be investing in for the um, for the next year. So if someone's year end is uh, is March, then make sure you're talking to them in October so that you can mm -hmm. have time to to form a relationship and help them to understand the value of what you're bringing to the table so that it can get mm -hmm. into the following year's budget. That's good. That's good advice. Um, okay, next question is, what is a big pain point you see in the food industry? 
Well, um, one of the reasons I joined CPAN is because I think there is lack of connectivity. We've got mm -hmm. amazing people doing amazing things all across the country. Uh, finding each other is very, very difficult. Uh, understanding how to work together and even how to put together agreements. You know, there's, there's, it's like MOU and NDA itis out there. Like uh, everybody's yes. like, yeah, we want to work together, and then nothing happens. So uh, I, I think that 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 the big gap in the food industry is is that we're not. We're not, uh, we're not, and it's a word that got an ugly reputation because it was overused, but we're not synergizing. We're all just mm -hmm. trying to do our thing. And, and um, so I really think that, that open innovation that, uh, that, you know, makes sense for all the players. A lot of the open innovation I've seen in Canada is one big company just basically wanting to have the right of first refusal on on another yeah. smaller company, the R and D. And I think that is is a really big opportunity for all of us to to kind of you know come together. We're never going to compete on price internationally, which is a good thing because we have healthcare and we have a social mm -hmm. safety net and I think that we should be proud of that and never think about dismantling it in fact I'd like to see us enhance it uh, so how are we going to compete we're going to compete by being first to market with really cool hard to copy stuff and mm. that is going to be really interesting now that the liberal government is back in and this carbon tax is coming through all of a sudden shipping a baby carrot from the Holland Marsh to California to be tumbled and packaged to come back to be sold in Canada, that's going to be four times as expensive with this carbon tax. Yes. So that's going to hopefully help us to develop more infrastructure for further processing. And that is going to be, I think, very, very influential in helping the Canadian food economy to become um, more efficient and yeah. uh, more more self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Yes, more more stuff going on here, and less stuff that we're shipping from overseas would be really good to see. Yeah, amazing. Um, okay, next question is: What food innovation trends do you see over the next five to ten years? And we uh, yeah, so if you notes. For this question if you tuned in yesterday to Seattle Connect you will have seen me with a, um, uh, a look back at the last 20 years of trends with Isabel Marquis uh, and and we identified that uh, convenience and sustainability and uh, and um, health and wellness will continue to be you know really big macro trends mm -hmm. that will you know kind of iterate and um, and certainly you know uh, be expressed in new and interesting ways. And then I hosted a panel where we dug into that even further with a panel from across the country with, with different sets of expertise. And uh, so there was a lot more granular stuff there. Some of the highlights were about how you can't just work on a trend now in isolation. You can't just say this of climate uh, crisis uh, uh, is is now to the point where where Canadian consumers and consumers around the world, it's like there has to be some sustainability benefit in yeah. the product, and and it doesn't matter, um, you know, kind of what you're doing. You you can't do anything without thinking about all those those other pieces. Mm -hmm. Which means it's become a, a little bit more complex to identify the unique selling point of a product, but yeah. It also it also means that um, yeah hopefully it, it, hopefully that'll encourage more of that collaboration mm -hmm. that I'm craving. Uh, just a personal question related to that is how um, do you feel about upcycled products that are starting to come into the market? I love it personally. I, I'm uh, as a consumer, I respond very very well to that whole idea of upcycling. I've even started going to um, a shop that is called Rare Threads. It's a clothing store in in Caledon, uh, not far from where I live. It's at the Elton Mill Art Center, and they have all these upcycled clothes, and they're wow. gorgeous. Yeah, and so I've bought a couple of things there. I, I've 
Um, I don't know. It's interesting because I think about my I, my grandmothers who both raised big families on farms, you know, through and and directly after the depression. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's right. They they reused every plastic bag and yeah. and why why not package your your products in mason jars and let people reuse them for their own yeah. canning or as storage. And some people yeah. are even using using mason jars as drinking glasses. So I exactly, think there's a yeah. lot to lot to learn from that that uh, yeah. that, that tradition. Yeah, yeah. I hope to see more of those ingredients coming coming through for sure. Mm -hmm. And I like how you uh, yeah you tied that into other things too, like uh, like clothing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we well, definitely because the, the the upcycle opportunity might not be in the food stream, right? So mm -hmm. you may have some fibers or something left over after you make a product, and they might taste terrible. But that's mm -hmm. okay. They could still potentially mm -hmm. be something other than just compost, right? So yeah about who can use what you've got you know some of the cool examples from dairy are you know obviously making vodka from whey using whey to uh to melt um ice on the roads i mean there's mm. there's it's often it's often a bit unexpected what your waste yeah. can, can can add value right. to yeah. awesome um, okay, next question is, what would your advice be for graduate students who want to work in the food and beverage industry? Yeah, my advice, uh, I, you know, after working at the University of Guelph with the research enterprise, so that means anybody from master's student to, you know, um, professor emeritus, what I can say is that industry really, really wants to hire super smart, highly qualified personnel but they don't want to take a chance on anyone who doesn't understand business. So mm -hmm. find out the definition of fiduciary duty, and I will tell it to you right now. Uh, fiduciary duty is, is what a CEO, uh, that's what they get paid for, and that is maximizing the return to the shareholders. So it is about making money. Mm -hmm. So get as much experience as you can working with industry, learn their lingo. And when you go into interviews with industry, make yeah. sure you tell them how you added value. And if you can say that a project added value that was monetary and you can quantify that, you'll be speaking their language. You, um, you have lots to offer, but, but you need to package your skill set in a way that is appetizing for for industry so mm -hmm. volunteer and get as much experience as you can uh, working on projects that solve financial puzzles and make sure those are like right top of of your resume and in your cover letter yes yes good uh good point about volunteering um you know volunteering for an organization such as cifst also can get you some Perfect. some higher level experience and also higher level uh, connections and contacts that you would not get otherwise so that's another and one more thing when you yeah. sorry this is a pet peeve of mine when you put a resume out there for a job that is yeah. non-academic you can just say published in so many journals do not put okay. do not send somebody a 20-page resume with all your citations because they really just don't care and then it makes it good. seem it makes it seem like you you are still very invested in research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, yeah, the employer who is not doing the academics doesn't care about every single thing. But they, it's pretty cool that you are published. So we should be they love that. that. They love that, yeah. but they they don't need a full, you know, um, yeah, a full citation list. Yeah, that's a great tip. I love that. I might add that to my own resume myself. <laughs> Not that I'm looking for a job, I'm pretty happy here. I was gonna say, I think usually <laughs> if you try to leave, they'll, 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 there'll be some kind of a some kind of an intervention. They'll block. No, those. no, I'm not leaving. I'm staying. <laughs> you, know, you need resumes for other reasons. Um, okay, next question uh, is pretty cool too. How do you see alternative proteins such as insects becoming mainstream in North America? So the insect thing is so interesting. This is another thing Isabel and I talked about yesterday because we'd had a winner in the CL Innovation Awards a couple of years ago, Quick Start Bars. And uh, when I was at Food Starter, I had like four insect companies at one point working there. And I think that uh, that's a great example of, um, of, of 
of wanting something to be successful mm -hmm. uh, beyond sort of its uh, its time. You and I think insect protein in particular does have a real place in the um, in the food innovation spectrum, but I think it'll be a long time. It's a very long runway before it gets into people. So the companies I see who are doing best are the ones who are using insect uh, protein for animal feed, for aquaculture, and, mm -hmm. uh, and pet food, which of course is just a, a, a segment of animal feed. Um, there's a lot of other ways to get protein and the off flavors in uh, a lot of insects and you working for, you know, a, a ingredient company would understand like it's hard, they're hard to yeah. mask sometimes. Yeah. So I don't really see, I don't really see everybody starting to eat a ton of insect protein at home or even in restaurants, but alternative proteins certainly are a massive growth area. I'm really interested in you know cellular meat and cultivated meat whatever we're actually going to end up calling it mm -hmm. and in Canada building capacity uh, in, in that space and figuring out all the regulatory that goes with it but the fact of the matter is is until we get all the regulatory stuff in place none of these very novel uh, items can really mm -hmm. go too far and uh, because they'll they'll be restricted and, and consumers won't won't have the trust so I think that's yeah. why you see that's why you see you know the the more traditional um, vegetable and plant-based proteins continuing to grow while the other ones yeah. kind of you know they they, they, they there's a they, people have to learn learn mm -hmm. to trust them and 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 find them appetizing yeah, I like hearing your explanation there because I I, I I was surprised that insects didn't take off and it, it, you're right, it was a case of people wanting it more than the industry actually or the consumers were ready yeah. for it. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, so we'll have to keep watching that. And I think it was uh, also a question of, are they vegan? Are they not vegan? I think we settled on their well, not vegan. No, exactly. Well, obviously not. They were moving around for God's sake, so, you know. But um, but that comes into really understanding why people are vegetarian, vegan, and and segmenting that group down. Because will cellular meat be considered vegan? I say no, because it's made from animal cells. But if you're a vegan because of compassion, mm. uh, compassionate reasons, you don't want to hurt animals, and you don't want them to go, you know, to go through a um, a life that is that is, you know, basically. Uh, um, you know, being contained and not out in the wild, and you're against, yeah. you know, the cruelty of of sending them to an abattoir. Then cellular meat might be for you. And so it's 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 all it's it's it, there's a lot of big questions to, to figure yeah. out. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, next question is: What do you think are the best solutions for tackling food waste? Well, I wish I knew all the answers to that Me that too. question. But interestingly, Cher Merriweather, a friend of mine, a professional mm -hmm. friend of mine who is the CEO of Provision Coalition, mm -hmm. she and I were having a chat recently and she said something that really stuck with me. And she said that one of the problems with focusing just on food waste is that you don't think about the whole package of of drivers there so she said you know if you if you make smaller portions of things that are in packages versus selling like a whole bunch of something or or a case of something well then you have more packaging and then you're putting more plastic into landfills and then you're this 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 and this so um her point was that any problem you're tackling you need to look at systemically and i thought that was very very smart and i would defer future questions on this topic to share no. <laughs> yeah, she's definitely an expert on that. Yeah, that's a good one. It's I, I saw the question. And I thought, hmm, I don't think we can tackle that in a few minutes. No, I I, I have you know seen some cool projects and things, but um, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's uh, you know, there's a um, uh, in Guelph, there's the Repurpose Lab, which I think is Cher's project, and now there's a uh, Coil. I can't remember exactly what Coil stands for, but uh, it's a, a project about upcycling and, and food waste that's been launched by the city of Guelph. So lots of great people involved with that for anyone who's interested in digging into that topic. 
Awesome. Uh, okay, next question is someone else looking for advice. So as a food scientist without any work experience, uh, how would you recommend they try to get a job in Canada or the USA? So no work experience in industry, I'm assuming, yeah. right? Um, okay. As opposed to work experience in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, again, I think it's the same advice we just talked about, Belinda. Mm -hmm. I think it's yeah. I think it's about getting your stuff out there um and 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 networking joining associations so for instance uh you and i of course both belong to cifst and i think you and i also both belong to women in food industry management yes. which is right. not just for women mm -hmm. uh there's uh and and other types of those groups there's some really active forums on LinkedIn for uh, people who want to talk about various food industry topics. And there's, you know, in, in hopefully very soon, there'll be more networking events. So get out and about, uh, try to meet some people, you know, yeah. pick people say, can I have 15 minutes to just ask you a couple of questions? And one of the questions you should ask them is who else should I talk to? And, yeah. and just, you know, start, start getting yourself into, into the milieu and, uh, and demonstrating that you're, that you're, you're there and, and that you're keen. Do you, do you, what you, you've, you probably have some other good tips. I'm, I'm, Happy yeah, no, yeah networking yeah networking volunteering to me are the two um the two yeah you need to get out there and i mean just just uh, i imagined um what you just talked about you know talking to people for 15 minutes and uh asking them who else you should talk to that that right there will get them right in yeah right if they but you have to make the effort you have to um you have to take some 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 risks and some chances and um but that's all a part of of uh, you know getting a job so if you you have mm. to get, you have to get started That's and another little shameless plug uh become a cfin member because very yeah. soon or as soon as i can uh i'll be launching a platform where people can have conversations with other people so uh both live and in in sort of a more social media type format and that'll be another i hope another really valuable way for people to to network in in the yeah. food innovation space yeah that, that would be great I'll have to look into that one these do okay, i love this next question what is the craziest food trend to come along in the past 15 years that you encountered well, you know, that's an interesting question. And, and so for me, just to answer the question, I'll just very quickly tell you how I define trend. So if you think of a big tree in your yard, in the park, um, there's a big solid trunk that for me would be the food space. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's other, you know, big branches that come off. To me, those are the macro trends. And a few that I mentioned earlier, convenience yeah. and wellness and, and um, et cetera. So the um, and then the branches, the, the the leaves on the branches, to me, those are food fads. They last for less than a year. Mm. So the fads are usually the wackadoodle things. Yeah, um, I, I would say that one of the ones that was so strange popular for me was that whole celery juice thing a couple of years ago yes. when everybody was you know the price of celery went whoosh like up to like five or six dollars yeah. because people were convinced that that um drinking celery juice was was this the the you know the way to fast track to to being super healthy and mm -hmm. and it's so interesting understanding those kinds of fads though are really helpful for people who want to understand food trends because there's always something, an essential piece to those uh, events that you can learn from and use. So you and I will remember from being in this business as long as we have, Belinda, that when Atkins was a big thing, everybody shifted their innovation pipeline. And by yes. the time most companies had products to launch, it was over. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. would argue that the echo effect of Atkins is this whole protein trend that's driving yeah. keto and paleo and yeah. and and that it has matured so if you if you think about it and you figure out mm -hmm. what is it that's that's actually mm -hmm. the, the the click point for those wacky little right. things then then you can ideate on what 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 that need state is what made people feel yes. like that was was worth spending five dollars on salary for 
And yeah. that's where you get your real insight that helps you to be ahead of everybody else when uh, when when you you know launch something that mm -hmm. that answers that need, but maybe in a very different way than the than the first little fad. I love that. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, and I, I do see that uh, keto is just Atkins rebranded, so it's interesting. Yeah. And paleo too. Yeah, interesting. I don't get paleo though. Like, think about it. No. How old, how old did cavemen live? I bet they were lucky to be like 30. So yeah. why do we want to be like cavemen? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. No. Yeah, no, I, I've had a lot of conversations about that one. So <laughs> keto, there's some, there is some science behind that one. So I can understand it, but paleo, no. Yeah. So good thing that that one's kind of uh, morphed more into keto now. So, yeah. um, so are there any new ideas that have yet to be developed? think they're probably oh, I'm sure I'm <laughs> sure there are wouldn't it be sad if there weren't like what fun would this yeah. business be if there weren't you know I, that's the thing right for people in in the innovation space is that you always have to be you've got to be a donkey so you know you've got to have that carrot that you've got your eye on and you never know what direction and what path you're going to take to get to the carrot and once you get to the carrot there's a new one over here mm -hmm. and that's what I love about this business. Like, yes. it would be boring if we got to the end. Yeah, no, I will we'll never be at the end. And I think uh, that's, what, that's the great thing about the food industry is there's always new people coming in with new ideas and it's not just the same old, same old all the time. So it is very, very dynamic. So it's an amazing industry, yeah. Um, getting back to keto. So um, what are trends around the keto lifestyle and what's the growth potential of this market? So I think probably like growth, what do you think the growth potential is still for keto? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. And I think keto has changed as the um, alternative protein space has changed. You know, at the beginning, it was all like bulletproof coffee, gobs of butter. Mm -hmm. Now I see, um, I follow she was one of my food starter clients, uh, Nea Shanalia, who owns Switch Grocery, which is a you know a yeah. keto online uh, grocery provider, and and um, and she provides a lot of thought leadership too. And uh, when I look at you know her her posts, they're 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 all about exploring keto these days from um, from from different entry points, I guess. So I, I, when keto first started, I, I think it appealed mostly to people who did eat a lot of meat. And I think it was really hard for vegetarians uh, to, to, to find their place in keto. So I would say that's what's interesting and, and developing mm -hmm. is how, uh, how, how products that that accommodate more lifestyles and eating styles have have mm. been brought into that pantry because it was a pretty small shelf, you know, of foods yeah. at the beginning. And yeah. I certainly see that it that it's expanded and there's a lot of companies working against uh, eliminating sugar generally or yeah. reducing sugar, which may yeah. not make them 100% keto, but it makes them much more in that that neighborhood, and um, I find that's interesting. There's one of my U of G companies that I was working with uh, uh, until I left is called Treatly, and they're doing amazing low sugar, no sugar baking mixes, which are really really good. So that's uh, that that's that's where I think I see the innovation is in is in yeah. getting keto keto diet followers. The, the foods they need to continue with keto because otherwise it's not very sustainable. Like you, right. eventually you're gonna want a piece of cake, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so maybe helping with some other things like people who are diabetic or just- The diabetic sugar. opportunity is very yeah. valuable, um, not just, you know, from a healthcare uh, expense, you know, societal lens, but but obviously people living with, with diabetes, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. It, there's so much innovation in the care uh, side of diabetes, but yeah, definitely bringing people, you know, so that they can share foods with others. Having yeah. you know, without getting too personal, my my brother was a juvenile diabetic, so I grew up in a household where he was always excluded. It was like, here's yes. Vincent's muffin, here's everybody else's yummy muffins, yeah. and 
so so that 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 mm -hmm. is wonderful to see that that the interesting keto has put more resources into solving yeah. some of the problems that diabetics have dealt with for a long time in a more satisfactory yeah. way yeah it is good it is a good thing um so let's look at a couple of the uh submitted questions from the audience so you did talk a little bit about um uh vitro meat and given mm. the current hesitation of the market what do you think companies can do to increase consumers acceptance to this product and that's uh, submitted by tran Nguyen. yeah great question tran and one i actually was asking myself of of some uh people that that i trust recently um ontario genomics who does a lot of great work in all kinds of research and policy and stuff, they're coming out with a report in November about this whole topic, and I'm really hoping that there'll be some research on it. Intuitively, I feel that it's going to be a long slug uh, to get people to understand it. And to that point, uh, CFIN's uh, Twitter page last week put out a poll question asking people, what their appetite was for trying cellular meat. We were being goofy. The, the questions were, can't wait to try it, yuck, or, and you go first. So not statistically valid uh, yeah. kind of results. We um, didn't get a ton of responses because we're such a new group, but of the 20 or 25 people who did respond, they were split almost completely evenly between those yeah. the top two. Uh, but what the but the insight that was most interesting to me was that people who were really really savvy like food writers who I thought would have instantly understood you know what's your what 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 it meant when we asked them about cellular meat and we even put in you know meat grown from cells uh, they were confused and and some of them answered it like oh that's so heavily processed i don't think those are good products and this and that and i was like well i jumped in and, and from my own handle and responded well do you mean you know plant-based products that you know contain novel ingredients such as and, and you guys can fill in the blanks there yeah. and that is what they thought we were talking about so that oh, shows you wow. the level of 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 the the how few people are socialized to this topic even so yeah. i think it's going to require a long uh and deep and i think the way uh impossible burger worked do you know that in just the us alone impossible burger in one year spent two hundred and seventy thousand dollars on lobbying to get regulatory uh yeah to get regulatory acceptance for their their soy based heme so that's what it takes and and that yeah. number of years it's like about five years for for a company like impossible to come to market and then they still have to demonstrate that uh, you know like they have to walk the talk i guess finally when they yeah. get into market so i would say that we can learn from from that path so yeah did I answer that question i hope so <laughs> yeah you did i think you said there's there's uh, i don't even think the product is really understood so until it's understood no one will be accepting it so it's the education yeah. piece that has to come first yeah interesting i think we can get squeeze in one more question uh so from emily tang what are some emerging trends in fresh food packaging that you have seen that are sustainable like for example in fresh mm -hmm. or deli meats yeah, it, that's a very good question. And I feel like with the pandemic and not being able to go to trade shows that that mm -hmm. I'm probably not as up to date on, on some of those things. Yeah. Um, the ones that I'm really personally inspired by are, are the ones that that, um, you know, back to that sort of upcycling and, and reusing side, uh, I, I, I want, and I know that COVID doesn't allow it right now, but just before the pandemic, there were a lot of places that were allowing you to bring your own container to have mm -hmm. your needs and your take up stuff put into. And, and I really would love to continue seeing that. Like when I go to buy, um, to pick up sushi, I would love to be able to get there 
and give them my own platter and have them put yeah. it on and take the platter home. So to me, that then obviously that works in retail. That's not going to work in in manufactured mass um, marketed yeah. goods. But I do like the uh, the that idea, and I do think that we have to have better understanding of our own municipal systems and capacities before, uh, and, and that's so hard for manufacturers because they want to make something that's going to work across the country or across North America. But uh, we all need to understand what isn't in our, our local infrastructure and, and ask our mayors and our councillors to to fix that like if we if they don't actually have a biodigester that can handle some of these uh these bioplastics that are yeah. biodegradable then you know what why aren't why aren't we investing in it because uh yeah. um it, it's a it's a chicken and egg isn't it right like the, yeah. the it doesn't, yeah it doesn't really matter how great the solution is if 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 its promise can't be realized yeah, that's very interesting. I hadn't even considered that part. So that's very interesting. It's got to be, it has to be a whole system uh, approach. Yeah. Well, we have come to the end of our time. So, um, oh, so I know you did. It. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Dana, on behalf of CIFST, we'd like to thank you for this very informative session. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody who tuned in is, is fairly glad that they did and they learned a lot. I hope so. Um, so I think you've put in the um, the chat box uh, your email address if anybody wants yes. to locate you. Anytime. I, I might not be able to respond super quickly because I'm really just staffing up right now, but um, I, I yeah would love to connect. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you very, very much, Dana. And this takes us to the end of our webinar. Uh, so just a reminder that we are hosting these webinars every second Wednesday from September to November, and they are free for all CIFS team members. So please uh, tell your, your work colleagues. Please save the date for our next webinar, which is Wednesday, October 6th, and the topic will be announced soon. So thank you everyone for attending today's Ask Me Anything event, and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank Bye you. Bye-bye.